Thank you. I'm joined today by Professor the Honourable Gareth Evans, who's Distinguished Honorary Professor at the Australian National University, where he was Chancellor between 2010 and 2019. Professor Evans has had a long and distinguished career involving 21 years of activity in Australian politics, including spells as a cabinet minister in the Hawke and Keating governments, as well as participation in a large number of international peace and security commissions, in recognition of which he was made a companion of the Order of Australia in 2012. It is that international role that interests us today but most notably his work in co-chairing the Canadian-sponsored International Commission on Intervention in State Sovereignty, a commission that he co-chaired with Mohamed Hassanoun. His report, published in 2001, developed the influential principle of the responsibility to protect. Professor Ab Evans, welcome. Um, can I begin by saying that you, you've written that the commission uh, that you co-chaired developed a new way of talking about humanitarian intervention based not on the idea of rights, but on the idea of responsibility. Why was that so significant? Well, thank you, Albert, for the opportunity to talk to you and your students. It's a great pleasure. The, be, before the birth of Responsibility Protect with the Commission that you mentioned, it's important to appreciate that there was zero consensus out there in the international community about how to actually react to mass atrocity crimes, genocide, major war crimes, crimes against humanity, including ethnic cleansing. Despite the birth of a lot of international humanitarian law and human rights law, the Genocide Convention and everything else in the post-World War II years, and despite the, the horror show associated with the Cambodian genocide in the mid 70s, and despite the further series of horrors that were unleashed in the 1990s, we all remember Srebrenica, 8,000 men and boys uh, being massacred. We all remember Rwanda in 94 with hundreds of thousands of people uh, massacred, butchered in a genocidal burst, but outburst. But despite all that, there was zero consensus consensus-free zone as between the global north and the global south. The global north talked the talk about humanitarian intervention, the right of the, the right to intervene, the right of the big guys to throw their weight around militarily in these situations. The global south hated that talk. It was not insensitive to the scale of the catastrophes that were being perpetrated, but it hated the whole idea that there was a right to militarily intervene in newly won uh, sovereignty, uh, states feeling their fragility, and just generally uh, upset about the whole concept of civilizing missions by the big imperial powers. So even though there was a common appreciation of the, the scale of the agony that was being perpetrated with the repetition of these mass atrocity crimes, uh, nobody seemed able to do anything about it. So it was in that context that the Commission trying to recreate the possibility of consensus on this issue, uh, focused on, I suppose, three things in particular that were distinctive about our report that made a difference. The first thing was the linguistic change that you mentioned, changing the discourse from the language of the right to intervene to the responsibility to protect, getting away from right big boys to throw their weight around to the responsibility of everyone to protect the victimised, to talk about not so much the focus on intervention, but of protection, again, putting the focus on the victims. And that was a very, very important conceptual shift, rather in the same way I always quote Guru Brundtland's uh, Commission on Sustainable Development, created new ground between you know, the, the mad dog developers and the, the heavy duty greenies um, of that generation. They were able to find a common conceptual framework to argue about particular problems rather than just talking past each other. So the language was very important. The second thing that was very important was to broaden the, the notion of who the actors, the relevant actors were. It wasn't just the big guys with the military power to use if they chose to. And in fact, they didn't. They talked, but they didn't ever do anything. It was every country in the world it was, it was the responsibility of the countries that were where these things were being perpetrated, either through their own behaviour or the inability to deal with the behaviour of non-state actors in their own territory. It's the responsibility of others to help, to assist those who are in the mood to be assisted. It was the responsibility to act of everyone in circumstances where uh, these crimes were 
were taking place. And the third thing that was done in the Commission report was very important in terms of its ultimate embrace was to move the focus away from just that one dimensional military reaction to situations which had already careered out of control. We put very much emphasis on the need to prevent, to prevent in the long term, to prevent in the short term uh, when the first signs of imminent catastrophe were apparent, but also to address the larger, longer term underlying issues. Um, we focused on other forms of reaction than military reaction, on the, the utility of sanctions, of arms embargoes, of, a, of using the, the, the newly emerging international criminal law system, uh, of naming and shaming, of diplomatic isolation, of all those things were, were part of the repertoire that we systematically articulated. And when you put all those things together, you did make what for many people was a much more attractive package than just simply that talk about the right of humanitarian intervention. And it was that that led into the 2005 World Summit in which at General Assembly level, heads of state and government actually unanimously agreed to adopt this, this new principle, this new set of principles. And the language you, of, all, of all those changes, probably the linguistic change, the conceptual change that was most important in, in sort of capturing the mood of the need for consensus, but finding a way to doing it, of doing it uh, that people could live with on both sides of that north-south divide. Thank you very much for that. And it, it was precisely on that point of uh, conceptual change that I was going to uh, uh, pick up the discussion because you stressed very much the extent to which that conceptual change uh, provided a basis for consensus among states uh, in respect of the responsibility of everybody and also in respect of um, going beyond military intervention. Uh, but many people have uh, argued that despite that uh, influence of the principle of the responsibility to protect um, and shown in action, for example, in Kenya in 2008 and, and early on in Libya, um, in 2011. Um, it's, it's failed uh, to move states to action in uh, Syria, most notably, but also in Sri Lanka, Sudan, uh, Myanmar. Aren't, aren't these, so to speak, the Rwandas of the 21st century? Well, they are indeed, and it's very distressing to me that the international community has not been able to get its act together in a systematic way to react to them. We're still very much work in progress in that respect, but we should keep this stuff in context. What we're trying to do um, in initiating the whole idea of responsibility to protect and in the diplomatic exercise that had it embraced universally in 2005 was really four things. The first thing was to establish a new normative principle that people, even if they were fonder of rhetoric than they were of action, were at least willing to embrace in a way that they hadn't previously with the humanitarian intervention concept. So getting a new norm adopted, embraced, was the first benchmark of success. And in that respect, I think we remain a success story, as evidenced by uh, successive General Assembly debates and Security Council resolutions that continue to use the terminology and accept the basic principles, all, all three of them, that the states have a responsibility to act themselves to to protect their people from uh, atrocity crimes, that other states have a responsibility to assist states uh, in that enterprise, and that the wider international community has the responsibility to, to react with appropriate measures, including in the last extreme military measures, if a state is manifestly failing to exercise that responsibility. Those principles are debated every year in the General Assembly, and they're embraced. There's a handful of, um, handful of opponents uh, who just have not been prepared to accept that consensus in principle. The Cubas, the Venezuelas, the Nicaraguas and so on. I mean, they're, but the spoilers have, have ceased to be effective spoilers. The normative, the normative principle is there. Okay, so what you might say if it's not being observed in practice, but let's look at a couple of other things. The second benchmark that we had in mind was that the R2P, Responsibility to Protect, would be a, a catalyst for institutional measures, preventive measures states to organise effective civilian protection measures, for states to organise forms of military engagement that recognise the reality of these situations, which was somewhere between full-scale war fighting and traditional you know, peacekeeping. So we have had a number of states uh, that are deeply, deeply now engaged in thinking through and putting in place uh, measures of both military doctrine training and also civilian preparedness which make them much better able to address these situations as they arise than was the case in the past. We've got more than 50 states have established focal points, so-called, 
um, that is, a particular bureaucratic high-level individuals whose day job it is to monitor these unfolding situations and to energize a domestic response to them uh, when they arise. So, you know, the institutional catalyst f function has been pretty well pretty well done and I'm, I'm looking looking at all that's been achieved in that area i'm not unhappy about that at all the third thing that was very important was for r2p to operate as an effective preventive mechanism now of course when prevention succeeds uh, nothing happens and nobody notices and prevention always people talk the talk about prevention uh, we're often unwilling to put the resources to match that talk, but when prevention does succeed, it, it very rarely features in the checklist of successes. And one example I always give is Burundi, sitting next door to Rwanda in Central Africa with almost identical demographic environment and a long, long history of horrible massacres going back, you know, literally scores of decades. And over and over again, um, since 2005, Burundi has been on the edge of a volcano, but over and over again, every time that volcano has looked likely to erupt, there's been an intervention by the African Union or by the United Nations Security Council, invariably invoking the responsibility to protect principles. So it, it's worked at that level. Look, where it, where we, there's obviously been scope for extreme anxiety is that in some of these extreme situations that have erupted, above all Syria, but you've also mentioned Myanmar, and there are others as well, where R2P just has not had the traction that we hoped it would. It's a long and complicated story as to why that's the case. I mean, some of these situations are always going to be intractable. I mean, R2P is never going to be able to effectively deal with Chinese genocidal behavior against the Uyghurs in Xinjiang, for example. They're just too big and too powerful and too impossible to, to deal with other than you can try naming and shaming and diplomatic pressure. But you know, countries that big that choose to behave badly it's very hard to argue that this is going to make much difference. But in many, many other cases, um, it is important and possible for international pressure to be mounted and to, to make a difference. But it is crucial to get the Security Council once again behaving like the body that we hoped it would be. What went wrong is a long story and we haven't got time to go through it, but what really went wrong was in 2011 when, as you said, the Libyan case was a classic example of R2P working exactly as it should, an anticipated massacre of 20,000 or more people in Benghazi by Gaddafi's people, uh, was anticipated by the international community, feared by the international community. There was a united response and agreement to authorize a military action to engage in the necessary civilian protection through airstrikes and everything else. What happened after that success story, because such a massacre was averted, was that unfortunately the P3, the United States, the UK and, and France, really got ahead of steam up and said, well, that's terrific. Now we're about it. We're going to do the, the whole job, not just do civilian protection. We're going to knock this guy off his pedestal. We're going to do regime change. That was a bridge too far for the Russians, the Chinese, the Indians, the Brazilians, South Africans, the, the other BRICS countries that were on the Security Council at the time. Not least because the P3 didn't bother to consult with anybody. They just arrogantly said, we've got a mandate and we're going to run with it. Unfortunately, at the time this was happening and that this, <coughs> this reaction was being generated in Libya, the Syrian situation started to explode. And uh, rather than reacting not with military response, that was never going to work in a Syrian context at that early at early stage, but rather than reacting even with condemnation or sanctions or arms embargoes or threats of criminal prosecution, the Security Council was completely passive, did absolutely nothing at all, because there was this huge internal breakdown of consensus because of the argument of the the other states on the council that the, the P3 had gone too far and misused the mandate. So we had this argument, which we've been living with ever since, that if you give these buckets an inch, they'll take a mile. And it's a poor argument in all sorts of ways, and it's a depressing argument. And there are ways of dealing with this over time. But at the moment, we're sort of stuck in that warp. And Syria has been a disbeneficiary of that, as of other countries. And we've got a lot of work to do to, to rebuild that consensus. But let's keep on remembering that I2P is not just about military response authorized by the Security Council in extreme cases. It is about prevention. It is about diplomacy. It is about the use of sanctions and embargoes and use of the International Criminal Court and all those other diplomatic mechanisms. And in that respect, Respect, it, it hasn't been doing a bad job and we shouldn't we shouldn't give the game away.
Thank you very, thank you very much for that. And that, that really brings me on to my, uh, my next question, because one of the things I found very interesting uh, in your writing um, is the claim that um, the concept of the national interest uh, needs to be rethought. And you've written, for example, about the interest that countries have in being good international citizens, which I suppose speaks to that question of the normative context within which countries are operating. Uh, and I did note that, uh, and I think this was rather prescient actually in retrospect, that uh, back in 2019, you were talking about the interest that countries had in avoiding a global uh, pandemic. Um, mm. Is it really realistic to talk about this reconceptualization of the national interest in a in a period of America first or the uh, assertion of by China of its uh, security interests um, in the South China Sea and so on? Well, I've thought for a very long time that it doesn't do justice to the idea of national interest to focus, as everybody always still does, on just two boxes the geostrategic, the security interests that every state has in maintaining its integrity and safety, and the economic and trade and prosperity interests that every state has manifestly in improving the, the economic lot of its own citizens. People think all the time just in terms of those two boxes. But the world out there has a whole bunch of other problems which are conspicuously visible and not least the, the three big existential problems the world now obviously has. Climate change, pandemics, and of course, the risk of nuclear holocaust. And there are many other global public goods, regional public goods as well, issues like piracy and human trafficking and, and uh, terrorism and, and arms control indeed. Um, issues which Kofi Annan used to call problems without passports uh, because they're the kind of problems which are not identified with a single country at a particular time. They're problems that cross borders and their problems incapable of solutions except by cooperative international action. Now, the reality is that states that are good international citizens who see themselves as having a responsibility to engage in that cooperation, to stimulate that cooperation, to energize that cooperation, are states which enjoy a very considerable reputational advantage in the conduct of their international affairs. Think the Scandinavian countries, Sweden in particular, uh, over many years. Think Canada, at least under some governments. Uh, think Australia under some governments. Countries benefit reputationally from being seen to be the kinds of countries that take seriously these um, collective action problems, these, these common public good problems, and try to do something about it, recognizing that no state is big enough and strong enough anywhere to solve these problems individually, that cooperative collective action is required. So being a good international citizen not only matters because of the moral imperative to make the world safer and saner and to do good things, but it's also, it's a national interest because there are benefits that flow from being and being seen to be a good international citizen. There are reputational benefits. Squeaky clean Sweden is one of the world's biggest arms suppliers because everybody is comfortable dealing with squeaky clean Sweden. That, that's the reality. And there are reciprocity uh, issues, of course. Um, if you, if I cooperate in solving your piracy problem of um, of the Horn of Africa or somewhere or your your refugee um, flow situation, then those countries that you're being actively engaged in assisting are going to be all that much more willing to assist you when you want something from the international community, be it ever be it so trivial as a as a position on an international body or somewhere, a vote, or whether it's an engagement of resources or aid or military commitment in an extreme case to solve a particular problem. So what I'm trying to say is that the world as we see it at the moment and the COVID crisis has, has really just emphasized this, is full of these collective action problems, these full of these um, global public goods problems. And, um, and they're not easily identifiable simply in terms of those traditional security interests and economic interests. They're issues that really may not have a short term return at all in either security or economic terms, but are manifestly for the collective good overall. So countries which engage in this sort of activity uh, do, you know, have a hard headed interest as well as a, a moral interest. As to how the uh, the big guys are likely to react to all of this, obviously, if Trump um, stays in office, uh, then the United States is just a bust for the foreseeable future, as it has been for the last four years. 
Uh, let's face it, I mean, the United States has been a very bad international citizen under the Trump administration. There's no getting away from that. Uh, so that's that's a very big issue for us to be hanging our, our hats on, on in November. But as, as to China, I mean, China's behaved very badly in all sorts of ways. The wolf warrior stuff of recent months and its behavior in the South China Sea, its behavior internally in a number of issues, the Uyghurs, Tibet, Hong Kong, of course, uh, has not made it the flavor of the month. But, but I haven't given up on China in terms of understanding that it has a real national interest in uh, coming across as a, as a responsible stakeholder, uh, to coin a phrase that was coined a while ago. Uh, and we're seeing signs of that. I mean, I don't think it's just cynical opportunism that the Chinese have, um, that has led the Chinese to, to come out in the way they have on the, the climate issue. I don't think it's cynical opportunism that has led the Chinese to be the most significant P5 contributor to peacekeeping. I don't think it's, civil, it's, it's cynical opportunism that makes China a potentially very serious player as we try to get genuine arms control, nuclear arms control negotiations and move back from that incredibly dangerous reliance on nuclear weapons that, um, that the United States and Russia and others traditionally have. So um, I think it needs a bit of a wake up call. I think China needs to, Xi Jinping needs to rethink the utility of soft power, needs to rethink the utility of reputational advantage rather than just throwing his weight around. But I, I haven't given up on them. And I think those countries like Australia that are presently wrestling with a, a lot of bilateral hostility with China do have plenty of common ground to find with China in addressing some of these global and regional public goods issues. And I think uh, the United States will be a party to try to get some sense into these discussions if there is a change of government. And I think China will be less inclined to respond as provocatively as it has in recent times if it has a sense that the Americans are not trying to throw their weight around quite as cavalierly and stupidly as they have been under Trump. So in that in that context of uh, global citizenship and, and uh, public goods, one final question, if I may. I mean, you yourself have had a long and active career in the law, uh, academic writing, uh, public policy. What sort of qualities do you think it's important for those um, aspiring to a career in public service, particularly a career in public service that addresses some of these global public goods issues. What sort of qualities would you look for uh, in somebody uh, coming into uh, that career uh, early on in their stage? Well, can I say at the outset how important it is that young people have a public service career in mind as a serious option? Um, not only because of the objective difference you can make as a talented student of high ranking university to the resolution of these problems, but because of the personal satisfaction that's involved. There's all sorts of temptations with other professions, other careers to, to set your sights on, on joining one of those rich lists that are periodically published in the, uh, in the glossy supplements. But you know, the, personal, the personal satisfaction rich list is the one that people really should aspire to be on. And there is a real, a real degree of satisfaction to be achieved in public service, either working for governments or international organizations, or even let's, let's face it, going to politics. Although you have to have a pretty thick skin, I acknowledge these days to, uh, to suffer the, uh, the difficulties of what is a very bloody and dangerous trade. But, uh, but public, public service in one or other of these capacities is tremendously important. What are the qualities that make for effective contributions to public service? Well, well, the, the, there's a number of them. I mean, first of all, it's, it's motivation. Having the right motivation, you really, you really have to be the kind of person that wants to make society, wants to make the wider world a better place. If you're not really interested in that, well, go out and flog widgets or you know, do your micro stuff in a particular profession, but don't, don't, don't stop, um, don't think that you're going to contribute much to public. I mean, pub, good public servants, high level public servants that make a difference are those who really want to make a difference. Um, so there's the motivation issue. There's the skill sets that are required. There's the multiple skill sets um, to be successful in, in most careers, but a public service career, I mean, obviously, um, academic qualifications of the kind that they're hopefully getting under you, Albert. Um, there's um, obviously the the skill sets in terms of uh, written and oral communication skills, the skill sets in terms of, of social skills, I don't mean using the right knives and forks, but I mean showing some sort of empathy and some ability to relate to other people. Um, 
I'm thinking of organizational skills of the kind that you can generate through just engaging in clubs and societies sorts of activity. Um, all, all of these skill sets, you know, they don't come naturally to a lot of people, but they, they can be sort of acquired and they, they, they all contribute. Um, then, of course, what other qualifications you need, you do need a degree of experience, obviously, to get your foot in any any door, which is a, a terrible conundrum because how the hell do you get experience first up when you haven't had previous experience? So we go around in circles and this is a, an issue for huge numbers of young people, as I'm acutely aware. All you can do is really <coughs> grab every opportunity that comes your way to do in internships or work experience of a relevant kind, because there's no doubt whatsoever. When I was running the International Crisis Group out of Brussels um, for 10 years in the early 2000s, we had uh, 80 or 90 interns a year um, spread across the organization around the world. And invariably, when entry level jobs came up, we went to people who'd done internships with us because we knew them. We knew we knew that they had the skills. We weren't just relying on the, the references and the paper and so on. So grab those opportunities. I mean, the, the remaining thing I guess you need is, uh, is uh, you, you can put together the, uh, the motivation, you put together the skills, you can put together the experience, but you also need luck, a big dollop of luck. Uh, being in the right place at the right time, and we, we've all had during the course of our careers that sense of, of irritation that someone who hasn't had our skill sets has nonetheless managed to you know to to land be it an entry level job or a promotion or whatever this is this is life the main advice i always give in these situations is, is recognize that reality recognize that luck is going to play a part and don't put all your eggs in one basket always have two three four options in mind in terms of your career choices or your particular directional you know options that are in front of you so that you're not going to be too suicidal if um, if you miss out on one particular stream anyway that's that's a long and complicated um, set of prescriptions there but perhaps i, I can just finish with one final word i mean the, the great characteristic that matters most of all i think for success in any in any career, and particularly a public service career of some kind, is is a capacity for optimism, to maintain your sense that you can make a difference, to maintain your sense that effective action can lead to effective results. If you don't have that sense that something is not only worth doing but capable of being achieved. Uh, you're not really going to get out of bed in the morning. I mean, if, if, if you want that kind of career, you, you really have to just keep the faith. Um, I mean, optimism is, um, is not self-fulfilling, but it is self-reinforcing in a way that pessimism is very self-defeating. So that's, I guess, my, my basic message. That's why I call my, my political memoir, which I published a few years ago, I called it rather ridiculously incorrigible optimist because that I think that, that, that characterizes what has been the sort of sustaining motivation for me. I mean, there's all sorts of things I've wanted to achieve, but I've always got out of bed in the morning believing that something was achievable. That might have been totally wrong headed, but it is the kind of thing that sustained me. And it is the kind of thing that I think does sustain people in doing um, public service careers, which I hope very much that um, some at least of your students will be encouraged to do. Thank you so much for that. That good advice. Um, I would love to continue this uh, conversation on and on, but um, we both have time constraints and I'm extremely grateful to you and uh, particularly for uh, not only telling us about the responsibility to protect, but for those wise words on uh, career advice at the end. Uh, Gareth Evans, thank you very much indeed. My pleasure. Thank you.